Right, today I've come to Brixworth in Northamptonshire to see this beautiful Saxon church. And the scale of this church is absolutely staggering. This is a large village church. Just look how I compare to the fabric of this building. This is such a remarkably well-preserved large Saxon church, and it shows the kind of architecture that the Saxons could build that has been over the centuries eroded by war time and fashion. This is All Saints Church in Brixworth, and it is a wonderful example, one of the best preserved Saxon churches in England. Uh, it is certainly uh, the largest. It is huge compared to the little Saxon church we saw down in Bradford. No, not that one, the one upon the Avon. Um, this church is huge. It is the size of a large village church, and it probably dates from around uh, 750 to, 18, uh, to 830, at least the vast majority of it. It was attacked by the great heathen army in 870, um, but has otherwise managed to survive almost all the upheaval that we would have expected that would have torn uh, places like this down. In some towns that were richer, they would have torn it down and replaced it with something new and gothic, or entirely remodeled it like Winchester Cathedral to be new and gothic. Um, and in other parts of the country, which were poorer, uh, they would have let it fall to ruin and rebuilt something else a lot later. So it is amazing that we have this incredibly well-preserved Saxon church. As a Saxon church, it, it follows the plan of a Roman basilica. These were the preeminent styles uh, for religious buildings at the time. And this, this demonstrates a huge quantity of wealth. The leading theory is that it was financed by King King Ethelbald of uh, Mercia, who was one of the more powerful of the Saxon kings at the time. He controlled the large and fertile kingdom of Mercia, which roughly corresponds with the Midlands down to the River Thames. And this may have been one of the king's uh, primary worshipping residences. At the time, the kings of Mercia were uh, very annoyed that the preeminent Catholic diocese were in uh, Canterbury, controlled by Wessex, and uh, York, controlled by Northumbria. So they, for a little while, wanted to have their own diocese of the church, um, and it may have been that building this could have been part of that campaign to prove that they were worthy of having their own archbishop. These Romanesque archways are Saxon, but they're built using reclaimed Roman bricks that they would have scavenged from other properties. Um, one of the ways that you can tell that they are Roman bricks is their particular design. Romans liked long, flat bricks. And the builders of this church didn't seem to understand fully how an arch works. There is no attempt to make the stones thinner in the bottom and wider at the top. Uh, nonetheless, these arches have survived 1,200 years, so let's assume that they did know what they were doing. Uh, these archways have been uh, infilled with windows in the Norman period. Probably they were an interior uh, arcade, so these would have been passageways, and outside of them there would have been uh, little chapels. You can see roughly the line of where the original roofs of those chapels would have been, and each one of these um, would have been, well, they're called porticos, um, but they would have been spaces for separate prayer and reflection, possibly dedicated to different saints, possibly uh, for particular families or donators to the, uh, to the church. Um, and yes, they were then uh, torn down at some point and filled in with these uh, more Norman windows. Here we have another example of later medieval work. This is a Gothic archway. Gothic uh, developed as a style from around 1200. Uh, the oldest Gothic archways in Britain are in the Temple Church in London. One particularly interesting feature of this church is this uh, ambulatory around its apse which would have uh, originally led down to a crypt, uh, possibly as a uh, reliquary, uh, but now it's just a 
it's just really deep, <laughs> deep pit. Uh, this is the apse from the outside. It was rebuilt in the Victorian period to the original design um, as it was crumbling away to nothing. Uh, this protrusion is the Lady Chapel um, and possibly that gives us a hint of what uh, all of the outsides of the church would have looked like in the Saxon period. Uh, it's a chapel that uses uh, the, um, the porticos to uh, set aside a private space of prayer. This was created in the 13th or 14th centuries, and you can imagine that continuing all the way along lots of little chapels. Although it was never completely torn down and remodeled, or so heavily remodeled it would be unrecognizable, it has been remodeled over time. This is a uh, 13th or 14th century spire. This is not the sort of thing that Saxons used to build. Saxons used to build um, sort of gatehouse style porches. Uh, they didn't build towers and spires. So this is an example of how things were continually being rebuilt. This has been a continuous place of worship for 1,200 years after all. And this archway continues to be an original Saxon piece, so you can also see how the creators of the tower and spire wanted to use a great deal of the original fabric of the building, uh, probably as a cost-cutting measure. So they didn't want to lose too much of it because it would be so difficult to rebuild it. And I think that it's that mix of having sufficient wealth to um, work on this building, but not so much wealth that they can entirely remodel it, which has enabled us to have this wonderful example of a largely intact Saxon fabric. This is a wonderful piece of Saxon carving. It shows an eagle carved into a piece of reclaimed stone from an original Roman villa, uh, and was probably carved around 640 AD. By 750, when this building was probably constructed, although it may have been constructed later uh, after the sack by the Vikings in 870, uh, religious fervor was really taking hold in England. It had been about a century since the first Christian missionaries came to the Saxon kingdoms, Augustine, uh, St. Birinus, many others. Um, they had generated now a huge religious fervor. The Anglo-Saxons finally felt that they had grasped the truth and they went whole hog into it. They founded hundreds of monasteries. They copied thousands of Bibles. They sent missionaries to old Saxony. They were spreading the word everywhere they could. They really felt that this was it. And that also may explain the massive scale of this building. This would have been one of the largest buildings built since the Romans left. It stole wholesale many Roman building materials, bricks scavenged from uh, ruins from the surrounding landscape. Um, it follows a Romanesque basilica plan, um, you know, things that you would find on the continent, Roman style architecture, but at the same time, these Saxons didn't have the full understanding that the Romans did. So their arches look much more crude uh, and, and much more clumsy. Although considering that they've stayed up for 1,200 years, they must have been doing something right. And with all that religious fervor came the separation between the common people and the clergy. This arch is not just an arch, uh, though it is, this was also the first physical uh, separation between the choir and the priesthood, who would have stayed on one side of it, and the common people, like me, who would have stayed on this side of it. There would have been a, a wood or stone screen that filled the space, physically separating the two. Uh, and it is the first known in England. Uh, it may not have been the first, but it's the first that we know about, and it's definitely one of the oldest that survives. Um, and at this time, Catholic doctrine meant that on that side came the miracles, the transubstanti transubstantiation of the Eucharist, physically turning into Jesus's body and blood. The altar and the gospels were on that side of the screen. Later centuries, uh, during the English Reformation, brought the altar closer to the middle of the church. Um, this one is still quite high in the, in the, in the church, quite close to the, the main altar. But in Church of England, a lot of altars will be down here, right in the middle. And that is where the pulpit is. This is where, in the English Reformation, the priests moved from incanting their Latin up at the top, you know, as transubstantiating the Eucharist, they moved down into the center and started providing religious instruction directly to the people in English as well. So in this church, we see the full breadth of the Reformation. <laughs> we see the very first Catholic separations between the people and their priesthood. And we see the priesthood returning right to the middle. 
In some ways, the entire history of the English church can be found in this building, though that might be over-egging the pudding just a little bit.